Okay, hi everyone. Um, can everyone hear me okay? You guys up the back, good. I've been asked to speak into this mic because we're recording the lecture today as a bit of a trial run, so we'll see how it goes. The hope is to maybe do a few lectures and then put them online so people who aren't able to attend or if you want to revisit them, then you can do that. Um, my name's Hesom, I'm an ophthalmologist. Um, my name's Hesom, I'm an ophthalmologist. Um, I studied at UWA. I was sitting in, well, not these seats, but FJ Clark, feels like yesterday. Um, and uh, I'm the coordinator for ophthalmology at UWA. So any questions, you're welcome to contact me, uh, write to us at that email address. Um, how many of you guys are doing the GP ophthalmology term right now? You, most of you. And how many aren't? How many are doing other stuff? Cool, okay. So did the year group get a message saying everyone was invited to this uh, lecture? You did, okay, cool, yep. So yeah, we, I'm, 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 this lecture may be repeated later this year if there's lots of people that couldn't attend and it looks like there are, but we'll see how we go. Um, just so you know, uh, for your ophthalmology term, you may know this already, but you'll have this lecture You'll have uh, a workshop, and the first one's next week, next Friday afternoon. So today's knowledge, next Friday afternoon's skills, clinical skills. And your clinic attachments will be sent out very soon if they haven't been already. So that's three half-day clinics at the different teaching hospitals. Uh, if any of you that come to Fremantle, that's where I work in public, so I'm there on a Friday morning. Uh, my advice for those clinic attachments is Find out where the uh, eye trauma uh, or acute eye cases are being seen. Find out who's seeing them. Usually it's an eye resident or one of the registrars and see if you can sit in with that person because often what happens is you get allocated to a consultant and most of us are subspecialists these days. So my subspecialty is retina. That's fine, you'll see some cool retinal stuff but um, you also want to get in and see the corneal abrasions and the conjunctivitis and, and the trauma and all those things because once you're an intern or a resident, that's what you'll be seeing. So you want to see as much of that as you can. So usually the, the resident or the registrar is a good person to approach and, and find out who's doing what that morning. Um, the assessments at the end of the term, as you probably know, so that's, I believe it's on the final Friday afternoon. Um, so that's a little way away. Uh, and I believe that's it for third year, and then there's, a, there's an ophthalmology OSCE in fourth year, or there has been in the past. It sounds like the, the OSCE for fourth year, is, the structure's uh, likely to change in the next couple of years, but you'll be notified about that. Um, that's probably enough housekeeping from me. Today's talk uh, is really focusing on the urgent stuff that mainly is gonna come through emergency departments. So when you're an ED as a student or an intern, this is the stuff that you're gonna see. Obviously, we can't cover every single urgent eye presentation in the world. So what I'm hoping to do is focus on the common and urgent stuff that you need to be able to assess and manage uh, in a safe way. Um, see how we go, we might break the talk up into two halves, have a little breather in the middle. Um, welcome to ask any questions at any stage. So I'll start off by just looking at the curriculum briefly. In ophthalmology, uh, you can really think of people presenting to emergency departments and GPs for two reasons. Either they've got a painful red eye or they've got visual disturbance. So loss of vision, partial loss of vision or something not quite right with the vision. Okay? This is why people turn up in the real world. So this is not a bad way to organize your thinking and your learning. So what I'm hoping to do today is give you a way of thinking about eyes uh, as well as some of the knowledge and the content. So what do I mean by red eye? So here's the common stuff, conjunctivitis, blepharitis. Yes? I'm sure there is a chance. Let's see. Uh, front. How's that? Does that help? Yeah, okay, good. Guys, this, this uh, presentation will be on LMS. 
um, afterwards, so you're welcome to take notes if that's how you learn, but uh, you don't have to. Um, all the abbreviations on here, I've got a little uh, table at the end uh, where they're all laid out, and I'll be talking about a lot of them anyway, so don't worry too much about the abbreviations. So foreign bodies, corneal abrasions, then you've got your sort of more serious trauma, which I'll talk about today. As far as visual disturbance, you've got your chronic diseases, age-related macular degeneration, cataract, this sort of thing. Um, and you've got some conditions which are in the middle. This stuff I'll talk about today, so things that affect the optic nerve, optic neuritis, giant cell arteritis, uh, conditions that affect the eyelids and the soft tissues around the eye, uh, infections and inflammation of the eye and the eye socket. Seems like a long list, um, but actually if you think of it in terms of red eye and visual disturbance, you can generally start to narrow down any presentation that's given to you. So it's a good, it's a good way to approach things. Uh, we'll talk about cranial nerve palsies and, and those things as well. Another way to think about eyes is think about what's common and what's serious. So today I'll be talking about the common stuff. It's the same 50 or so conditions, just organised a little bit differently. My advice is for these 30 to 50 conditions that you need to know, really the amount of knowledge that's expected is what fits on a flashcard or a palm card. Okay, so you don't need to know the ophthalmology chapter. I just want you guys to be safe. So we're talking about 30 to 50 palm cards. If you get your head around each condition enough, you should almost be able to anticipate the trigger, you know, if we're giving you a question in the exam, the trigger or the stem that describes that condition. So if I say bilateral red gritty eyes in, of, in any aged patient, any gender, doesn't matter, that has come on after a recent viral illness and there's a bit of lymphadenopathy and the eyes are a little bit watery, that's the stem for viral conjunctivitis, okay? So that's your thinking viral conjunctivitis when you hear that stem. But you've got to think about some other stuff as well. Could it be allergic? Could it be something else? If I say very painful unilateral red eye in a contact lens wearer, that's all I have to say. That's microbial keratitis until proven otherwise, okay? So I don't expect you to know that now, but if you start to develop that way of thinking about eyes, it'll make it easier for your exams, and it'll make it easier, more importantly, for real life, okay? So um, I'll, I'll try and frame things in that way. Uh, the other good way to think about uh, eyes, there is a lot in the history. Is it one eye, is it both eyes? Is it painful, painless? Is it a red eye or a white eye? Some conditions, the eye's completely white, doesn't look red at all. Is the vision actually disturbed? Sometimes it isn't. You can have a lid tumour but vision isn't affected. Uh, what about the onset? Is it instantaneous? Is it acute or subacute or chronic? And is it a single episode or is it a recurrent disease? So for example, uveitis, okay, or you may have heard that word. I'll talk about that today. Uveitis tends to be a recurrent disease. So that's also a clue as to what the condition might be. Uh, and also, these are all very, very important clues. As with the rest of medicine, Patients' demographics, they, their comorbidities. You know, if you're looking at an exam question, every word, every bit of information in that stem is there for a reason. So if we've said it's a 45-year-old Vietnamese lady, that's in there for a reason. Southeast Asian people get more angle closure glaucoma. You may have heard of that condition, acute angle closure glaucoma. I'll talk about that today. So again, pay attention to all of these things in your exams and in real life. Okay, so let's get on to the presentation. We'll do the first half and then see how dry my mouth is. So the sudden painful red eye. Let's start with the humble corneal abrasion. So the cornea is the clear window at the front of the eye. An abrasion is simply a scratch on the surface of the cornea um, of variable depth and size. Anyone here had a corneal abrasion? No one, wow. Oh, okay. Painful? Super painful. Yeah, more than you'd expect. So it's a, 
it's the first division of the trigeminal nerve, the ophthalmic division. Corneas are obviously really sensitive. So this person presents with pretty much instantaneous onset, painful, watery eye. And if it involves the central cornea, even if it doesn't, they've got blurred vision. Okay, so sudden onset. Often there's a history of trauma of some sort. So um, there'll be a clue there in the history. In real life, often it's a tradie who's been out in dirt and dust or he's been hammering something or, or metalwork. Um, people often get corneal abrasions gardening. Gardening's a very common cause. And then little kids, infants and toddlers, when you're holding them, they'll, they can give you a really nice corneal abrasion with a fingernail. So that's a pretty common cause as well. Here's what it looks like. So does anyone know why there's that green coloration on the surface of the cornea? Cornea doesn't look green normally. Yeah? Yeah. Yeah, this guy's had a corneal abrasion, so he knows. Um, so there's an orange dye that we use on the surface of the eye. Uh, it's called fluorescein, sodium fluorescein. Uh, you may see it in the workshop that we do next week. And sodium, so fluorescein is taken up by um, devitalized corneal epithelial cells. So it stains damaged corneal epithelial cells. And it stains it as green, particularly if you turn the blue light on, on the slit lamp, corneal abrasion will shine back at you in bright green. So if you're not sure whether there's an abrasion there or not, then fluoresce fluorescein is the way to help diagnose it. The other way to help diagnose it is by putting a drop of local anesthetic on the eye. So if someone's got a painful eye and you put a drop of two or three drops of local on and 90% of the pain's gone, that tells you it's an ocular surface problem. It's something on the surface. If you put in that local anesthetic and it doesn't help or it doesn't help that much, there's something else going on. So you've got to think a bit further. Um, and that's just an example of a, a central corneal abrasion. So corneal abrasions, unless you've seen a few and you're very comfortable with them, generally you want to refer them to us, um, particularly it's if it's involving the centre and particularly if it's a big one. They can become infected. So uh, a normal corneal abrasion is clear. You can't see it unless you use fluorescein. If they become infected, you'll see something white on the cornea. And I'll show you some pictures of that in a moment. You want to give this person antibiotic ointment and or drops to cover them until they see us. So chloramphenicol is the most common one that's out there. Chlorsig is the trade name. That's the ointment. It's like an like antibiotic in a paraffin gel. And uh, we generally use that three times a day or four times a day. Whether to pad the eye or not, I generally don't pad the eye. There's some evidence that padding the eye can, can worsen abrasions because the person's blinking under the pad and the pad's scratching the eye itself. Some people like pads. What I think is more useful is a clear plastic shield. So there's this clear plastic eye shield. Stick one of those over the eye so they don't rub it accidentally, you get more stuff in it, this sort of thing. And then obviously oral analgesia. So don't forget that, these are painful. Give them some simple analgesia. Okay, so let's move on to the foreign body. I've, I've had three of these. And they're also really painful because they cause a corneal abrasion. So most common causes of foreign body, again, it's the tradie, often grinding work when they use an angle grinder. So there's little bits of metal flying around. Even if they're wear, if, if they, if they wear safety goggles, you can still get a, a foreign body. They don't always travel in a straight line. They can travel in an arc. Um, they can be on the surface of the cornea. Uh, on the surface of the cornea, okay, so that's a little bit of metal. Or they can be under the upper eyelid. So there's a saying that no eye examination is complete unless until you've everted the eyelid. And we'll show you next week how to, how to evert the upper eyelid. Then you can turn the lower eyelid out quite easily with the pressure um, of your, your finger as well. If, you, if someone's got a, uh, a subtarsal, so this is called a subtarsal corneal foreign body, often they'll have linear linear corneal abrasion uh, when you stain them with fluorescein because that foreign body is being scraped up and down on the cornea like a windshield wiper every time the person blinks. So yeah, super painful. Um, often these metal foreign bodies, so the most common thing is metal, they'll become embedded, okay? 
and they'll get a bit of rust around them. So the metal needs to be removed and the rust needs to be removed. If you leave rust, it can, it can actually cause uh, a necrosis of the surrounding corneal stroma. You can do both with a fine gauge needle, okay? So that sounds horrible, but actually it's happening every day in emergency departments all around Perth. And often it's the emergency guys that are doing it. It doesn't have to be us, although we do a lot as well. So uh, again, we'll talk about that in the workshop next week. And um, I had one of these the night before I started final year medical school. Couldn't go to sleep, went to emergency in Frio. Some nice registrar came along, picked the foreign body off my eye. And 10 years later, I was an ophthalmologist. So there you go, you never know. Um, again, these guys need antibiotic cover. They're at risk of infection, so don't forget about that. Analgesia, all the other common sense stuff. I've deliberately not put words on these slides, but don't worry, there's lots of material on LMS, and I'll give you some references at the end, okay? Chemical injury, common, potentially really dangerous. This is potentially blinding, okay? And it's the alkaline injuries that are the worst. So acid sounds, intuitively sounds worse, but it isn't. Acid actually stops penetrating the cornea, um, whereas alkaline continues to chew through the cornea, even if you've got a tiny bit left on the eye. Alkaline generally comes, the most common thing is work sites, okay? So construction, builders, brickies, the materials are plaster, lime, concrete. These are the things that are alkaline. Cleaners get this sometimes, so splash, splashback from cleaning solutions, bleach. Cleaning solutions can be acidic or basic. Uh, so try and find out what it was that they actually got in the eye. Find out if they washed the eye on site. Um, most construction sites these days do have little portable eye wash stations. It's kind of mandatory. Um, these people will be in a fair bit of pain. Uh, the eyelids can be involved, as you see with the guy on the top. If they're not treated appropriately, this is what happens later on. So you get opacification of the cornea, people can go blind. You, often you'll have an associated corneal abrasion. So there's the green fluorescein stain on the um, cornea again. So what you want to do with these guys is try and determine what the material was. Uh, put in some topical anaesthetic straight away, anaesthetic drops, makes them more comfortable. And then you want to irrigate the eye with normal saline or distilled water or ring as lactate, it doesn't really matter as long as it's a sterile solution. And you want to irrigate it with at least one to two litres. So what that means is you lie the person flat. Uh, you can, if, if the emergency department's got a thing called a Morgan lens, this is a contact lens that you connect up to a, to a bag. And then you can, you, once the eye is anaesthetized, you can just lie the patient there and that'll run, you know, a litre of fluid across the eye at a time. Top up the local anaesthetic every 15 minutes or so because it wears off, obviously. And you can check the pH of the eye with a little litmus paper as, as you go along. So you can check it at the start, it might be eight or more, and then recheck it at regular intervals to make sure you're going the right way. Um, these guys definitely need to be referred to us and it's an urgent referral. Um, oral analgesia, uh, obviously. And the final trick is do avert the top and bottom eyelids and use a little cotton tip. Uh, wet the cotton tip with local anaesthetic or with saline and just sweep the upper and lower lid because if you've got fine plaster or cement dust, that can stay sequestered in under the eyelids and continue to damage the eye even if all the big particles are gone. So you need to sweep um, the eyelids as well. So yeah, common and needs to be treated urgently. The key thing is irrigation. So that, that, that was the sudden red eye stuff where, where it's sort of instantaneous onset. Let's move on to some acute. So by acute, I mean not seconds, but more like minutes to hours, okay? So I touched on microbial keratitis earlier. This is the contact lens wearer, okay? That's the classic sort of presentation. There's a white blob on the cornea, okay? The cornea should be a clear window. Any white blob on the 
cornea is abnormal until proven otherwise. You can get corneal opacifications that are chronic and benign, but these guys present with a painful red eye. And you can see how red or injected that eye is. Injected is the word that we use in ophthalmology to mean red, if you hear that word. Um, they'll pre uh, present with severe pain. Uh, the mechanism is you've got a foreign body in the eye when you're wearing a contact lens, so it's quite easy to scratch the eye. There's lots and lots of commensals around the eyelid, normal skin flora, uh, the staph species particularly, and they get in there and, and cause an infection. The bug that we really worry about is Pseudomonas. Okay? So Pseudomonas uh, in animal models can chew through the cornea in 24 hours, believe it or not. Um, so it can thin the cornea out very, very quickly. So again, this is a very urgent um, presentation. So the one on the left is bacterial uh, microbial keratitis, okay, the top left one. Does anyone know what this one on the on your right is? Yeah? Sorry? Yeah, HSV. So, so herpes virus um, can be HSV. Varicella can do that as well. So in the eye it tends to be HSV1. It's not the genital uh, herpes, which is HSV2. Uh, either varicella or herpes can do this. Fairly common. So lights up. It's called a dendritic ulcer. Dendrite means root or branch. So it's meant to look like a branch. Sometimes it looks as classic as that. Often it doesn't. So you need to have an index of suspicion. Uh, the key thing here with, with both of these conditions is to never be tempted to treat with topical steroid drops. Okay, Steroid drops make people feel better. Steroids just make people feel better. Uh, and it's no different when it comes to eye drops. It'll, it'll uh, make people more comfortable, but it'll exacerbate the infection. So we sometimes use steroid drops down the track once the acute infection is under control. But don't ever start steroid drops um, uh, unless you've spoken to an ophthalmologist first. So dendritic ulcer, that's a hepatic virus. Ask about whether, they've had, whether they get cold sores, it's a cold sore virus, with HSV, that's a cold sore virus. So do they get vesicles around the eye, around the mouth, etc.? cetera? Um, with varicella, they get shingles. So often they've got um, ophthalmic shingles. It doesn't always affect the eye, but you need to have an index of suspicion. That's treated, so uh, this one, we treat with topical acyclovir, okay, topical antiviral, five times a day. It's called Zavirax, that's the trade name. You want that to go for at least five days, probably more, and follow up with us. Uh, shingles is treated, as you probably know, with oral acyclovir or valacyclovir, depending on, on where you are. Um, and you want to catch it in this first 72 hours um, and treat it orally. Topical acyclovir doesn't actually have a place with um, shingles-associated red eye, uh, but uh, a lot of people end up using it anyway. It's, there's no harm in using it, but the mainstay of treatment is the oral treatment in the first 72 hours. The other thing with shingles is the key sign, does anyone know the sign that indicates that the eye is likely to be involved? This lady's got it. So it's called Hutchinson's sign. And it's when, it's when the rash extends down to, the, to involve the tip of the nose, which tells you that the nasociliary nerve has been affected, therefore the eye is going to be affected. More simply than that, is the eye red? So if you've got an ulcer on your eye, you're going to have a red eye. If you don't have a red eye, it doesn't mean that you definitely don't have eye involvement, um, but it's less likely. And here's a picture of a, a contact lens keratitis or, or a bacterial keratitis. Does anybody know what this white fluid level is? It needs to stop working. What's that? Any guesses? No. So hypopian. A hypopian is a collection of white cells in the anterior chamber, in the front part of the eye. Okay. So when you have a really bad infection or inflammation, the white cells gather there in the front part of the eye and it forms a little, basically, pus in the front of the eye. But it's just an indicator of really bad disease. And almost certainly these people need to be admitted. Okay? So it's an indicator of, of severity. Um, 
This one will be contact lens related. These guys get admitted and get around the clock, 24 hour uh, fortified topical antibiotic drops, okay? So that's the management for, for most microbial keratitis uh, patients. Not so much the viral ones, but the bacterial ones. So you need to prepare that person for an admission, promptly contact us, analgesia, contact lenses out, okay? Contact lenses out of both eyes. Uh, we call that a contact lens holiday, okay? And if they've got their contact lens with them, or the case, then grab that, because we can send that off to culture, try and find out what the organism was. We also do a culture directly from the lesion. So we numb the eye and then scrape the infiltrate and then put that on a number of plates, blood and chocolate and so on, uh, and then get sensitivities and, and refine our treatment based on that. So quite common, okay? All the public hospitals around town usually have one, of the, one or two of these patients hanging around uh, as, as inpatients. Okay, so I talked about angle closure, acute angle closure glaucoma earlier. What, what does that mean? So the eye has a fluid, it's got a system where it creates fluid and it's got a system where it drains fluid and most of that happens towards the front of the eye, okay? So this is, here's a cross-section sagittal through the eye. Um, oh, can you guys even see that? No, I can, yeah, it looks great on this screen, not so good on that one. I'll have to describe it to you. So, you've got the anterior chamber, which is like, a, think of it as a small room, okay? And behind, that, behind the anterior chamber, or at the back of the anterior chamber, you've got the iris, the coloured part of the eye. In the middle of the iris is the pupil. That's a hole um, in the iris tissue. So, the normal fluid uh, sort of dynamic in the eye is fluid gets produced behind the iris, okay? And then it pumps through the pupil into the anterior chamber and then gets pumped out in the corners of the anterior chamber, okay? So it goes from the back through the pupil out of the corners through a drainage mechanism. Those corners, they're called the angle. That's what the angle is. What happens in the most common form of angle closure is what we call pupil block where the fluid can't get out through the pupil. So it gets stuck behind the iris. The iris kind of swells forwards and it blocks the angle because it's tenting forwards, right? So you've got fluid being produced that can't get out and the drain is shut. So fluid just builds up like a balloon, pressure goes through the roof, normal pressure is 10 to 20, angle closure 50 plus. And so these guys present with severe pain, okay? So this is a cause of severe pain. It tends to be pain that involves the whole eye socket and the head. So they may actually present with headache rather than eye pain. But it's a severe headache to the point where they're vomiting, okay? And they're, they're needing opioids. Um, almost never happens under the age of 40. So the question stem is... 40 plus, severe pain, vomiting, Southeast Asian, more common in that demographic. Uh, and then some of the clinical signs are red eye, obviously. The pupil's mid-dilated because the pressure's so high you get relative pupil ischemia and it's not as reactive and parts of it may be stuck to the lens. So mid-dilated, poorly reactive pupil. Um, Vision's down because the cornea becomes swollen, so a hazy cornea is another one of the signs. So if you just imagine if you just pump a balloon up really hard, what's it going to do? Um, and you can actually, if you gently press on the eye, you'll feel the difference between a normal eye and an eye that's got angle closure. Treatment is, ad is admission, okay? And we give these guys Dimox or Acetazolamide, which is used in some other conditions. So we give them that systemically at a fairly high dose. That reduces the production of aqueous fluid in the eye. So you want to reduce production and you want to increase outflow. And we increase outflow by using eye drops. So there's four classes of eye drops. You don't need to know them, but uh, we use 
um, at least three of those classes, as well as systemic DIMOX. And the last thing we do, if they've got pupil block, is shoot a little hole in the iris. So this is called a peripheral iridotomy. Peripheral because it's in the periphery of the iris. Iridotomy means a hole in the iris. And what that does is it allows a trap fluid, it's like a bypass, it allows a trap fluid behind the iris to shoot forward into the anterior chamber. So the iris is no longer tenting forwards because the pressure has been relieved. The angle opens up a little bit and you get increased outflow through the angle. Um, so management is admission, Dimox, the right drops, and the urgent referral to us. Okay, how are you guys going so far? You hanging in there? Okay. All right, endophthalmitis. This is like the great white shark of our world. This is like the thing you want to see the least. This is an infection of the whole eye. And there's a hypopian again. Often requires surgery. That's what that bottom um, image indicates. Endophthalmitis means infection more or less from front to back. Okay. So you get cells in the front, so you've got the hypopian in the anterior chamber, but you also get lots of inflammatory cells in the back where the vitreous jelly is, so you get what we call a vitritis. And if you've got cells in the front and cells in the back, person's vision is going to be down. Most common cause of endo endophthalmitis these days is after an injection into the eye or after cataract surgery. So injections are super common. You'll see some when you attend the clinic. And cataract surgery is also a very common procedure. And this is usually a gram-positive bug somehow. I mean, obviously, we use antiseptic, but occasionally you get a resistant organism, and sometimes it's in inexplicable. Um, but this is an acute, very painful red eye with reduced vision following an ophthalmic procedure. That's the history, or that's the stem. If the person's immunocompromised, that increases their risk. All diabetics are immunocompromised to some extent, so the incidence is, high, is higher in, in uh, people with diabetes. Um, and they need to be treated as a potential theatre candidate. So that means fasting, okay, uh, urgent referral to us, start fasting the patient. We may or may not ask for systemic antibiotics, so you can discuss that um, over the phone. Generally, um, don't need any eye drops going on the eye unless it's a microbial keratitis. You guys remember the contact lens pictures. That then turns into an endophthalmitis. That can happen as well. Um, but generally, this is systemic management. And so you guys know what we do for them is, is we take a sample of vitreous out of the back of the eye. So we use a needle and a, and, a, and a syringe and literally suck some jelly out of the back of the eye after we anesthetize the eye, obviously. Send that off to the lab and then we inject some antibiotics into the back of the eye. So we inject, typically we inject vancomycin and keftazidine if we're sus suspecting bacterial endophthalmitis, which most, of, which most endophthalmitis is. It's mostly bacterial. So that's called a tap and inject, okay? So we tap some vitreous and we inject some antibiotics. So someone says, how do you manage endophthalmitis? You say, we fast the patient, we ask about systemic antibiotics, we make an urgent referral to ophthalmology, and we expect that they will do a tap and inject. And the examiner will go, wow, that's, you sound like you do ophthalmology. That's really good. That's the management. Um, not that common, but definitely an emergency. If it's a very bad endophthalmitis, they'll actually go to theatre and have all the jelly in the back sucked out and replaced with clear saline solution and antibiotics injected into the eye at the time. Um, and increasingly, the trend these days is for earlier surgery. The outcomes, increasingly the evidence suggests that, that the outcomes are better if you just go to theatre sooner, unless they've only got a little bit of vitritis, not too bad. Okay. So uveitis... I touched on earlier, what is the uvea? Does anyone know? The uveal tract, I remember that from anatomy. The, the, the uvea is the pigmented 
vascular layer of the eye, okay? Pigmented vascular layer. So if you think of the eye, think of the eye as a coconut, okay? The outside layer, the hard husk, that's the sclera, connective tissue. And at the front of the eye, the hard husk is the cornea. It happens to be clear, but it's still hard, tough connective tissue, okay? The flesh of the coconut, the soft, squishy flesh, that's the uvea. Uvea is kind of soft and squishy. Um, it contains uh, all of the, uh, most of the vasculature, and uh, it's also pigmented. That's why, you're, that's why eyes are coloured, because the front part of the uvea is the iris. Okay? So when you look at someone's eyes, you're looking at the front part of their uveal tract. So the anterior uvea is the iris. Okay? The intermediate uvea, the next bit back, is called the ciliary body. That's the bit that produces the aqueous fluid. And the posterior uvea is called the choroid. Okay? The choroid is what supports and nourishes the retina. It sits underneath the retina. So choroid is full of blood vessels. So on this picture, which kind of shows up, not that well, the UV is the ones that, you know, that has the red boxes around it. So there's the iris at the front, there's the ciliary body, and then the choroid extends all the way around the back. Uveitis is inflammation of any of these bits. So you can have anterior uveitis, intermediate uveitis, posterior uveitis, or pan uveitis. It just depends on the cause. What are some of the signs that you'll see? These little dots on the cornea are little precipitates of inflammatory cells. So this is an inflammatory condition, generally, not infective, or I'll talk about the inflammatory ones first. Most common cause of uveitis is associated with um, what are called the seronegative arthropathy, arthropathies. So we're talking about ankylizing spondylitis. You guys may have heard of that. Those people will be HLA B27 positive. And that's quite a common cause of uveitis in young people. So what's the stem? Young person, unilateral red eye, glare and photosensitivity. These guys become quite photosensitive because the iris is involved. And the iris is constantly constricting and dilating during everyday life, every second. So if it's inflamed, then reacting to light becomes quite painful. So glare and sensitivity is common. A history of angst bond or some other sort of autoimmune condition. So psoriasis uh, or another form of um, immune arthritis, okay? Recent viral condition. So it can happen as a post-viral phenomenon. Ulcerative colitis, um, rheumatoid arthritis, it's a, it's a long list. A lot of people call uveitis arthritis in the eye. That's, that's how you can think of it. So it's inflammatory. The, the treatment is drops, topical drops. Um, and it is a recurrent condition. So often uveitis patient will tell you that they have uveitis. Okay? Uh, often presents unilateral more often than bilateral. Um, and vision can be down if it's bad enough, for sure. So keratic precipitates, keratic, which means pertaining to the cornea, and precipitate, which means precipitate. That's one of the signs. Um, this sign is called posterior synechiae. Okay? Posterior synechiae. Uh, again, don't worry, all this stuff is, is in the slides on LMS. An inflamed iris can stick to the lens. It's, it's behind it. So parts of that iris stick to the lens. Other parts don't. They continue to dilate as normal. So as a result, you get this funny sort of cauliflower-shaped pupil. So that's another sign of uveitis. And this is a picture of posterior uveitis. So if you've ever seen a picture of the back of the eye, the fundus, normally you can clearly see the optic nerve, clearly see the retinal vessels and so on. It's all obscured in this picture because there's so much vitritis, there's so much inflammation in the back. The most common cause of posterior uveitis in the world is toxoplasmosis, and which, as you might know, life cycle goes through cats, and it's in the soil, and it's very common. Um, so this, this person will definitely have blurred vision, and you try and look in the back of the eye, 
and you can't get a view. You've got a very hazy view. Um, so that's toxo. But more commonly, uveitis is anterior rather than posterior. Uh, so that this picture is the more common sort of uveitis that you'll see turning up to, a, to an emergency department. Any questions about any of that so far? Happy. Okay. This is really a broad brush overview. I mean, you could give 10 lectures on uveitis alone. <laughs> But uh, I'm just trying to point out the salient features of each condition. Yes? Yeah, that's a good question. So um, key things are conjunctivitis more often bilateral, okay? Even if it's asymmetric, it's more often bilateral. Conjunctivitis, you tend to get what we call chemosis, which means swelling of the conjunctiva. So in addition to being red, the conjunctiva in conjunctivitis tends to be a little bit boggy and edematous. So if you have a close look just with your naked eye, or particularly if you get them on a slit lamp, you can often appreciate that sort of bogginess of the um, conjunctiva in conjunctivitis versus uveitis. Um, often there'll be a prodrome with conjunctivitis. So I had a cough or a cold or something recent, uh, infectious contacts with conjunctivitis is a clue. So um, conjunctivitis in the early stage is super contagious. That's why you keep kids at home and keep adults at home for that matter, whereas uveitis is not contagious. Uh, conjunctivitis is just more common. Uh, that's the other thing. So most red eyes will be conjunctivitis, not uveitis. Uh, so there's some of the um, distinguishing features. Um, your uveitis patient will, will also ha often have autoimmune type comorbidities, which your conjunctivitis person doesn't need to have. Everybody gets conjunctivitis, more or less, at some stage. Um, if you examine the eye on a slit lamp, then in uveitis, you'll, you'll find those keratic precipitates, which you won't with con conjunctivitis. Uh, you might see the posterior synechiae, which I showed you earlier, which you won't with conjunctivitis. And also, uh, maybe something that isn't so visible on, on these pictures, is in uveitis, because the, in anterior uveitis at least, because the iris is inflamed, you tend to get inflammatory cells in the anterior chamber in the front part of the eye. So if you look carefully with the slit lamp and you magnify the view enough, you can actually see those inflammatory cells floating around in the anterior chamber. So we call those anterior chamber cells, okay? So often you'll have a person with unilateral uveitis you look at the affected eye, you're, and you're, the beam on the slit lamp is full of cells. You see all these cells swirling around like they look like dust. So you know if you go to the movies and you're looking at the projector beam, you can see the dust highlighted in the projector beam? It's almost exactly what cells in the anterior chamber look like. In an eye with conjunctivitis, you might have one or two, most of us have one or two cells floating around in our anterior chamber, but you won't have that really strong anterior chamber reaction like you do in uveitis. So Lots of ways you can help distinguish between the two. The sort of um, the motto or the saying in Australia, thanks to a, a Melbourne ophthalmologist, famous Melbourne ophthalmologist, is beware the unilateral red eye. So all ophthalmologists know that saying, but a lot of older GPs do as well. Because conjunctivitis almost always becomes bilateral. So if you've got a painful unilateral red eye, you have to think of other stuff. So, that, so in a nutshell, that's, that's the answer to your question. Anything else? Okay, so preceptal cellulitis. What is preceptal cellulitis? The septum, the orbital septum, is a bit of connective tissue that doesn't show up on my slide. But if you can imagine, um, here's the eyelid. Here's the, here's the connective tissue, the firm connective tissue part of the eyelid, which we'll talk about next week in the workshop. That connective tissue bit, which separates the eyelid into an anterior lamella, so anterior soft tissue and, and some posterior soft tissue behind it, that continues up as the orbital septum. The orbital septum is what's in between your eyelid and your eye socket. It's a thin layer of connective tissue, okay? Preceptal cellulitis, as the name suggests, 
is infection or inflammation of the tissue in front of the orbital septum, okay? In front of the orbital septum. The septum's there to prevent it going back into the eye socket. Orbit means eye socket, okay? So preceptor cellulitis means skin is infected or inflamed around the eye, as you can see in this little guy. Uh, often in kids, probably most often in kids, more than adults, uh, often uh, following a, a recent upper respiratory tract infection or local trauma to the area. So an insect bite or a scratch from some other reason and they get preceptal cellulitis. Uh, the eye is white, okay, because it hasn't, it's not affecting the eye socket, it's not affecting the eyeball. Uh, and uh, yeah, common in babies, infants, toddlers. Um, again, you see that the eye is white, eye is not affected. Treatment here, you have to have an index of suspicion in your assessment for preceptal cellulitis can extend backwards and become postceptal cellulitis or orbital cellulitis, okay, and infect the whole eye socket. Orbital cellulitis can be catastrophic. So you treat these things really seriously. Um, how can you tell the difference between preceptal and postceptal? Well, preceptal, the eye is white. Both of them had red inflamed skin around the eyelids. But in preceptal, the eye is white, um, at least initially. In preceptal, the eye movements are normal. You know, the eye turns in every direction because the muscles around the eye haven't been affected. In preceptal, the pupil responses are normal because the optic nerve hasn't been affected. And if the person's old enough that you can check vision, the vision's also normal because it hasn't been affected. With preceptal, usually also the kid's happy. So they're not systemically unwell. Usually by the time someone's got orbital cellulitis, they're really crook. They're systemically unwell, they may have a fever. Usually they've got a sinusitis or some other seeding cause of the um, orbital cellulitis. Um, so you treat preceptal cellulitis with oral antibiotics, but you have to consider imaging them. And I would discuss it with ophthalmology for sure because you don't want to miss an early orbital cellulitis. Uh, if you're going to uh, image someone in adults, it's easier to do a CT, quick CT. You don't want to irradiate children. So sometimes you've got to give them a short um, general anaesthetic and do an MRI. And they do that at the kids' hospital. Okay. doesn't mean everyone gets an MR. Sometimes it's barn or preceptal, but uh, postceptal has to be in the back of your mind. Antibiotic of choice usually is augmentin or cephalexin or something like that. Cover for gram positives, that's the most common cause. The other thing uh, that I tend to do is if you get a little surgical marking pen uh, and trace the outline of the erythema, uh, if everyone's happy that it's preceptal, you're discharging them with oral antibiotics, just trace the outline of the erythema and I would see them the next day or two days time at the very most. And in the meantime, you tell mum or dad that if the redness is extending past the uh, outline of what you've traced, then they come back urgently. Because the oral antibiotics tend to work pretty quickly. It tends to be better by the next day, quite quickly. Um, so that's a good sort of trick for, for not missing an infection that's getting worse. Obviously, you want to check vital signs, make sure they're not febrile, um, all of those things. So, if it, get, if it does get worse, here's a guy I saw at Royal Perth a couple of years ago. Um, if you look carefully, you'll see the whole side of his face is edematous. And his eyeball, if you look at the bottom, if you look at the level of his upper eyelid, you can imagine his right upper eyelid would close here. So his whole eyeball on the left is displaced downwards. The whole eyeball has been shifted downwards because he's got a collection over the top of the eye in the orbit. So you could just look at that picture and say this guy's got postceptal or orbital cellulitis because he's got a massive amount of edema. But more important than that, the globe has been shifted. The globe doesn't shift in 
preceptal cellulitis. The globe isn't affected at all, right? This guy was unwell. He wasn't happy. He was febrile. So um, he, had a, he had an intraorbital collection of infection, okay? Sometimes these guys need surgery. They certainly need admission for, in, for IV antibiotics, okay? And, and possibly surgery. Um, so if you lift up the eyelid, this is what you see. Eyeballs clearly uh, affected. So you can see it's red. Uh, and the conjunctiva is swollen. So that's chemosis that I was talking about earlier. So a good question could be, well, how do I know it's not conjunctivitis? The short answer to that is, you, you know, the conjunctivitis patient is not systemically unwell. They're unhappy, but they're not a sick person, whereas this person's generally um, sick. And also all the eye movement restriction and stuff that you tend to get with orbital cellulitis, you don't get that with conjunctivitis. Um, here's a little kid with, clearly has orbital cellulitis, okay? So look, conjunctiva is red, swollen, and the eye is proptosed. That's the other thing. So the eye is bulging forward, proptosis. You don't get that in preceptal. And if you do a CT scan, this is what you see. You see the proptosis. You see this, what we call stranding of the soft tissues behind the globe. And you see a lot of soft tissue swelling of the eyelids as well. So it affects the front and the back. These guys can get an optic neuropathy if they're not treated because the optic nerve just gets squashed by all of this swelling and inflammation. So you can go blind from orbital cellulitis. It's potentially a fatal condition as well. So of everything that I've showed you so far, uh, this is the one that can kill people. I've, I've seen one patient die from this um, because it can disseminate into the brain. You can get a cavernous sinus thrombosis. You can get uh, intracranial infection. Um, so this is an urgent condition. It's a threat to both sight and life. Uh, so have a low threshold for discussing um, what you know erythema around the eye with uh, with us. Dacrocystitis is a is a cousin of orbital cellulitis, or and and preceptal. So it's, an, so it's an infection of the lacrimal sac. The sac that the tears drain into um, can affect all ages. The distinguishing thing is the inflammation is uh, at the junction of the eye and the nose in the area where the lacrimal sac is. And uh, again, these guys need to be treated with IV antibiotics. Most of them go on to need surgery, what we call a dacrocystorhinostomy, which means you create a new... Um, tract between the eye and the nose. Tears drain into the nose. Dacrocystitis causes that drainage system to become blocked. So once the acute infection is over, they need, uh, they're likely to, ne to need an operation. But the key thing here is recognise an infection. It's got all the hallmarks of infection. Um, don't just give them eye drops. At the very least, you're giving them oral antibiotics, more likely IV antibiotics. Okay, we've got one more section before we, or shall we have a break now? Who, who votes for doing this next section before the break? <laughs> okay, I think there's, there's, there's enough votes there. Um, let's power through and then we'll have a little breather. Uh, so has anyone ever seen this in emergency? popped eyeball, globe rupture, or penetrating injury from something sharp. Unfortunately, it's not uncommon. Uh, the most common mechanism, car accidents and assaults, unfortunately. So uh, assaults with a weapon, uh, people getting bottled on the head. Um, a fist can give you a globe rupture. Uh, and then sporting and recreational injuries and industrial in injuries. That's where it tends to happen. Um, key thing here is you've got a, an, a brown thing sticking out of the eye, okay, which doesn't belong there, and the pupil is completely misshapen. So what's happened there is <clears throat> the eye has ruptured at the front, either by something sharp or blunt, and 
It's a bit like opening the door in, a, in an aircraft. There's negative pressure, there's positive pressure inside, therefore everything inside wants to fly outside. So the iris is a wobbly structure, it flies outside and actually plugs the, tends to plug the wound. You can't leave that there though, because that's going to get infected, so that these guys go to theatre. Um, here's another one. So if you, don't, if you weren't looking too closely, you might just go, oh, there's something brown on the eye, it's, who knows, it's a freckle. But um, you've got to be guided by the history and also the, the shape of the pupil. I don't know how clear that is to you guys. But we call that a teardrop pupil, where it's, or a peaked pupil, where it's peaked towards the site of the injury. So the pupil points to the injury, if you like. And there'll be something in the history that, that, uh, that is the clue. O obviously, it's painful. Vision's down. Um, farmers repairing fences is a common cause of this, because a bit of the fencing wire pokes in the eye. Another one is hammering. So people who hammer, you can get a foreign body that just shoots straight into the eye, causes a penetrating injury, and then you've got an intraocular foreign body as well. Um, I think this was a knife attack, I believe. Uh, and what you'll see on imaging is, a, you know, the soft tissue swelling at the front, that's fine. Um, whoops. But more importantly, the shape of the eyeball is distorted. So there's a nice round soccer ball. This looks a little bit more like a squashed grape. Um, so definitely don't put any pressure on the eye because if there's a wound, the contents will expulse. This person's going to theatre. So your management is call us, fast the patient, check the tetanus status uh, and give them tetanus if they haven't had it in the last five years. Stick a shield, clear plastic shield over the eye. Don't pad the eye because again, the pressure of the pad can make things worse. No topical drops at all, because the topical stuff could go inside the eye. Uh, analgesia, anti-emetic. You don't want them to vomit, otherwise pressure in the eye goes up. Valsalva type um, mechanism. So again, that can be expulsive. If they've got a cough, give them some codeine, suppress the cough, suppress nausea, and um, speak to us. You also want to do a more thorough assessment. If the, if the, if the injury was bad, bad enough to, to puncture or pop the eye, obviously you're thinking about intracranial injuries and other injuries as well. So you've got to head, do a head-to-toe assessment of these people. Um, again, if the, if the force of an injury is high enough, you can get bleeding in the front of the eye. I had a guy like this this week. So this is blood in the anterior chamber. Okay, in the front part of the eye. Generally, these guys need to be admitted um, because the blood sitting there, you know, the angle that I talked about earlier, the drainage part of the eye, that becomes clogged with red blood cells and inflammatory cells. Can't drain fluid, pressure goes up. If pressure stays, stays high, eventually that'll cause an optic neuropathy. So you don't want to discharge these people home. Um, so, and the most common cause of this is blunt trauma blunt trauma. So uh, tennis balls can do it, cricket balls can do it. Squash balls are actually the worst. Squash balls, not uncommon, cause a globe rupture, never mind high femur, because it's a perfect size to fit in the eye socket. And that's why squash players wear goggles. Um, if a high femur is bad enough, the pressure stays too high for too long, we take them to theatre and we do an anterior chamber washout. Okay. So bright red stuff in the front part of the eye, that's a high femur. The history will be the clue. Uh, management is topical steroid drops to reduce the inflammation, uh, as well as topical pressure lowering drops. Get the person to sleep on several pillows, not just one, so that the stuff drains to the bottom. And um, analgesia if they need it, um, and urgent referral to us. All of these are urgent referral to us. It kind of goes without saying. This is the urgent lecture. Okay, retrobulbar hemorrhage. This is another doozy. So this is when you get a bleed in the eye socket, in the orbit, behind the eye. And as a result, you get a compression syndrome. Uh, blood's got nowhere to go. 
continues to collect, squashes the optic nerve, patient loses vision, unless that pressure is relieved. Most common scenario, again, is blunt trauma of some sort. Often it's little old ladies falling over, okay? So a little old lady falls over, hits her head on the bedside table or on the ground, and she gets a bleed at the back of the eye. She gets a black eye, but more importantly, there's bleeding behind. The clue is, the clues, proptosis, very hard eye, so rock hard, you press on it uh, gently, compare it to the other side. Vision is down or gone, so a simple black eye shouldn't do that. Um, but it's really the firmness of the socket and the proptosis that's the clue. Extraocular movements may be affected because it's all too hard and firm back there. Um, and these guys need what we call a lateral canthotomy. Have you come across this in emergency at all? Lateral canthotomy, cantholysis. So what that means is you're cutting the lateral part of the eyelid, okay? So where the top and bottom eyelid come together, here, you anesthetize that. And emergency, you know, ED registrars and, and maybe even residents do this. It doesn't have to be an ophthalmologist doing this, so it's a great skill to have. It's a fairly simple procedure to do um, once you know how to do it. And it's very satisfying because almost instantly the person gets some vision back and the pressure in the eye drops down immediately. What you're doing in cutting the side of the eyelid essentially is increasing the volume of the eye socket. So you're taking it from 10 cubic centimetres or whatever it is up to 12, 13, 14 and the whole orbital contents actually prolapses forward a little bit. You'll just kind of see it relax once you do your, your cut down. So the way to do it quickly is uh, numb the lateral part of the eyelid where the top and bottom eyelid meet. Use xylocaine with adrenaline so you get less bleeding that way. Put a, an artery clamp or forceps on there to squash the blood out of it. And once you've given it enough time to numb up, which only needs to be two minutes, then you just use some straight, sharp scissors. One goes under the eyelids, one goes over the top of the skin, and you cut laterally. And there should be some fairly firm, tough tissue there, which is the lateral canthal uh, tendon that you cut through. And that sort of separates the top and bottom eyelids and creates a bit more space for the whole orbital contents. Um, and uh, once you've done uh, the can the canthus is the name of the angle where the top and bottom eyelids meet, that's a, a lateral cut, so towards the ear. Then you do a second cut to go through the tendon, which is downwards. So again, you've got one blade of the scissors underneath the lid, one on top, and you cut downwards. When you guys are interns, you'll be watching this. You probably won't be doing it unless you're in whoop whoop. Um, but then it's easy enough to call one of us and you know, have it talk through. You don't want to delay doing lateral canthotomy and cantholysis. It's not something that can wait. It has to be done ASAP. Yep. Is that when you can sew it back up? Yeah, it can be sewed back up later, but it's, it's just a cosmetic. It's really a non-issue. I've seen people go blind from um, retroviral hematoma that hasn't been snipped um, quickly enough. But yeah, later on we put a few absorbable stitches through that and, and sew it back up. Um, so blunt trauma, falls, punch injuries, car accidents, proptosis, black eye, vision down. That's a retrobulbar uh, hematoma or hemorrhage. Orbital floor fracture goes hand in hand with all this stuff. Everything I've just talked about, if you hit the front part of the eye hard enough, the orbital floor is almost designed, it's very thin, like a trap door to fracture so that uh, it's like a pressure valve for the orbit. So it's not a bad thing that it fractures in many cases. It dissipates the energy um, when the eye's struck or when the orbit's struck and it increases the volume because now you've got the maxillary sinus sitting underneath to communicate with as well. Um, what it does do is it depresses the eye because the eye kind of falls into that trap door a little bit and it often entraps the inferior rectus, the bottom muscle which means that the eye can't turn up. You know, if the bottom is tethered, the eye can't turn up properly. So these people get double vision on up gaze. So if you get someone who's had blunt trauma, you're gonna test ocular motility as well as optic nerve function, and you're looking for a restriction of up gaze, and the patient will report double vision on up gaze. 
you want to do some imaging, CT is the quickest thing to do. It's good for visualizing bones. And you can see with this one, um, you've got blood in the maxillary sinus. Uh, that's very common. And you can actually see that, th you know, the trap door is sort of open there, whereas it's intact on the other side. And um, some of these need to be repaired, but not all of them. If it's just a small fracture with, with no entrapment, um, then often they'll um, they just improve with conservative management. You do need to give them oral antibiotics because um, you don't want them to develop a sinusitis. No nose blowing. You can imagine if you increase the, the pressure in the sinuses, it's going to do funny things to the eye. Um, and they need to be referred to us and, and MaxFax as well. So, so MaxFax usually end up doing these repairs and they'll put a mesh of some sort um, on the orbital floor. Sometimes the plastics guys do them as well. Um, so with an orbital floor fracture, uh, sometimes you'll feel a step. If you palpate along the inferior orbital margin, you'll feel a little step. Often the inferior orbital margin will be a little bit numb because they've gone through a sensory nerve down there. So there'll be some paresthesia or anesthesia. They won't feel it as much as they feel it on the other side. The history will be obvious, punch in the face, alleged assault or whatever, um, and restriction of upgaze. The one thing to watch out for with these guys, firstly, the, the entrapment of the inferior rectus very rarely is painful. Uh, so extreme pain means that expedites surgery. Uh, the other thing is sometimes if it's badly entrapped, it can invoke uh, a vagal response, so they can become quite bradycardic. So again, if the rectus muscle is badly entrapped and they're bradycardic, then they need to go to theater more urgently. Otherwise, we normally wait days, sometimes even a couple of weeks, uh, for all of the swelling to go down before they go to theatre. So that's a, it's also called a blowout fracture. Okay, here we are. Let's have a little breather and um, we'll come back and do the second half. We're hoping to create a bunch of online videos to go through um, the important topics concisely do you guys use videos now for, for learning? Yeah. So um, we've, got, we've made one. We've done a pilot of a video, uh, which should be on LMS. Has anyone seen it yet? It's how to test visual acuity. So actually, go on LMS and have a look at that before you come to the workshop next week. Because at least for test, testing visual acuity is the single most important clinical skill in ophthalmology. It'll, you'll just get more out of the workshop if you look at that video beforehand. Um, we actually did a little randomized trial of the video last year on 156 medical students, your peers, and the people that watched the video performed better on a Mokoski than the people that didn't. So <laughs> looks like it works. Um, okay, so uh, hopefully there'll be more videos this year. Okay, so let's move on to acute loss of vision, retinal detachment. This is a, a break in the retina retina being the light sensitive film at the back of the eye and vitreous fluid um, gets underneath that break and the, the retina progressively peels off the choroid which is the supportive tissue underneath um, causing initially causing a scotoma so visual field loss but if the retinal detachment continues to progress then it can cause complete loss of vision these guys present with flashes and floaters. Okay, so they're the buzzwords for risk of retinal detachment. They get flashing lights because the retina is flapping around. Um, so that causes a sensation of light in the eye. And they get floaters from little particles floating around the eye from a tear or a, or a rip in the retina. Okay, so flashes and floaters more commonly affects. Um, short-sighted people like me, so myopic people, my, myope means short-sighted. So your typical patient is myopic patient, flashes and floaters, trauma increases the risk because you imagine if you shake the eye around, the vitreous jelly in the back of the eye normally is stuck to the retina. All of us have vitreous that's stuck to our retina. Shake the eye around, the vitreous can tug on the retina, cause a tear, that's when you get a retinal detachment. So um, here's another fundus photo. 
showing uh, the tear and showing the areas of the retina tent tented up. Uh, looks like a little tent kind of flapping in the breeze that shouldn't normally be there. In this one, the detachment... Whoa. Wrong button. Uh, in the bottom one, the, d the detachments progressed to involve the macula. Okay? The macula is the central part of the retina and it's the bit that's most important for, for vision. So you can have a detachment off in the periphery like this. You may have a scotoma, but the central vision will still be fine. Once the macula comes off, then the visual prognosis goes down, even if we operate on them. So for that reason, retinal detachment is a very time-sensitive condition. Okay? And you can think of it as macula on or macula off. And the top one is a macula on retinal detachment. So they've both got flashes and floaters. The top person says, a bit of my visual field is missing, but um, I can still see in the middle. The bottom guy now can't see in the middle. He might still have some peripheral field. Okay. So, uh, and the image on the bottom right actually shows where the retina has come away or detached from the back of the eye. This is surgically treated. Retinal det detachments are treated with surgery um, where the retina is stuck on, back on to the back of the eye. It's a very successful operation in most cases, but it needs to happen promptly. So your job is to recognise that the person's at risk. You probably won't be able to see a detached retina, to be honest, because using a handheld ophthalmoscope, you don't get the field of view that you see in these pictures. You really need some of the equipment that we use, but don't worry about that. You just need to identify short-sighted patient, flashes and floaters, possibly visual field loss. I'm worried about a detachment. And then talk to us and know that they may possibly uh, end up needing to go to theatre. A much more common cause of flashes and floaters is just the jelly in the eye, the vitreous, pulling away from the retina. So that happens in most people by the time they're 60, 70, 80 years old. The jelly naturally detaches from the retina. And normally it detaches and it causes no problems. That also causes flashes and floaters. But unless you're able to visualise the whole retina, flashes and floaters are a retinal detachment until someone has done a dilated peripheral retinal exam, which is us. Okay? So vitreous detachment, more common, benign, but a diagnosis of exclusion. Flashes and floaters are a retinal detachment until proven otherwise. Um, what about a vitreous hemorrhage? So this is a bleed uh, into the back of the eye, into the jelly of the eye. Most common cause is diabetic eye disease, diabetic retinopathy, where you get a progression of blood vessel changes at the back of the eye. So the eye is the most common site of mass microvascular complications of diabetes. Okay, The eye is, is the organ that most commonly gets affected. And if diabetic retinopathy is severe enough, we call it proliferative diabetic retinopathy. Proliferative, which means new abnormal blood vessels have proliferated. The eye is so ischemic that it's now growing its own blood vessels and they're not healthy, they're abnormal, and they tend to bleed. So as a result, you get a hemorrhage in the back of the eye. The back of the eye fills up with blood, acute loss of vision, painless. Person, person describes a shadow going over the vision. Sometimes they'll even tell you that, that it was a reddish sort of shadow, whereas a retinal detachment person will just say there's a shadow or a curtain, but it doesn't really have a colour, it's just a, a scotoma. So vitreous hemorrhage, think... Diabetic, are they diabetic? With poor control, hasn't seen an eye specialist in a long time. Uh, the other cause of vitreous hemorrhage is trauma. So just like you get blood in the front with the, with the high femur, you can get blood in the back with a traumatic vitreous hemorrhage. So if you've got a non-diabetic, you've got to be thinking, well, what else has caused this bleed in the back? Okay. So if you've got a wide enough view and ophthalmic equipment, that's what a vitreous hemorrhage can look like blood everywhere where it doesn't belong. There are other causes of vitreous hemorrhage. Diabetes is just the most common one. If it's a bad enough vitreous hemorrhage, you can't see anything. Now, you guys can look for that with a handheld ophthalmoscope when you test the red reflex. Okay, so we'll show you how to do that next week. Normal person, dim the lights, use the ophthalmoscope at a distance of a metre or more. You get a nice 
bright orange light coming back at you through the pupil, right? Because it's bouncing off the retina. If you've got a vitreous hemorrhage, that reflex will be diminished or absent because the blood's in the way. Light can't get through to the eye. The same reason the person can't see is because there's stuff in the way. So even though you can't examine the whole peripheral retina, you can check for a red reflex, and that's a useful thing to do. Um, if you do an ultrasound, so the other ultrasounds show the detached retina. This one shows this white stuff, which doesn't belong there. The back chamber of the eye should be acoustically hollow. It should be black. There shouldn't be anything in it. Uh, but as you can see, this one isn't hollow. It's white because there's blood cells in there where normally there's just clear jelly. Okay, so it's no longer transparent. And how do we treat these guys? Treatment is systemic and ocular. So systemic means diabetes has to be controlled, so that's GP and endocrinologist. So they need to be involved. It's a whole body condition. Ocular management, if they've got proliferative disease, so that's the worst kind of diabetic eye disease, then we will laser the back of their eyes, okay? So retinal laser, um, or the acronym that we use is PRP, PRP laser, which stands for pan-retinal photocoagulation. Pan-retinal, whole of retina, photocoagulation, using light energy, photo, to coagulate or burn the back of the eye. So you're causing microscopic little burns to the retina. That's what those white, beautiful white dots are in that picture. So we do this all the time. This is an example of PRP laser. And so if someone has proliferative diabetic retinopathy, they're going to need PRP laser treatment. Um, and what that does is it reduce, what it actually does is it actually kills those parts of the retina that have been lasered. Um, but in doing so, it reduces the ischemic drive of those ischemic bits of retina. So you've got ischemic retina, which leads to proliferative disease. Essentially, you're, you're damaging or killing off those parts of the retina. Not the central retina, obviously, because if you do that, you blind the person. So that's a risk of doing PRP. You've got to, you've got to do it very carefully. Uh, but you're shooting the less essential parts of the retina to reduce the chance of vitreous hemorrhages in the future, to reduce the chance of proliferative disease getting worse and so on. So that's what PRP laser looks like. Um, next, uh, very common cause of acute vision loss in Australia, especially all developed countries, if, if you live in a rich country where people live a long time, they tend to get age-related macular degeneration. So this is actually the commonest cause of registered blindness in Australia, is macular degeneration. Macular degeneration, in simple terms, uh, is wear and tear at the back of the eye. Macular is the central part of the retina. Macular degeneration is wear and tear of the central part, which involves thinning of the retina. The retina can't pump out waste materials as well as it once could. The blood supply is not as, a good, not, not as good as it used to be. So you get abnormal blood vessels, again, different to di very different to diabetes, but similar in that you're getting abnormal blood vessels growing which can then bleed. So wet macular degeneration is when you have these abnormal blood vessels, which bleed and cause sudden loss of vision. Dry macular degeneration I'll talk about as part of another lecture. Dry macular degeneration does not cause sudden loss of vision. That causes slow changes in vision over time. But if you get an older person with sudden central loss of vision, Is that my imagination or? No, go on. Um, if you get older person with sudden central scotoma, because the macula is in the middle, right, then you're thinking wet macular degeneration, possibly, possibly. Um, with a retinal detachment or a vitreous hemorrhage, often the loss of vision comes more peripheral and they don't tend to be 80 years old. Your wet AMD patient is 70, 80. That's about the average age. So that's how they present. Painless, central loss of vision. Um, so just a, a little schematic showing you 
So a healthy macula, abnormal blood vessels growing under a, uh, an eye with AMD. This is, this is what it looks like to the patient, central blurring. And if you get a wide, you know, uh, a wide enough view of the macula, if you look closely, there's actually a little hemorrhage here. And that doesn't belong there uh, in, a, in a normal fundus. Also, all these little yellow spots, they're called drusen. Okay, so drusen deposits, and they're little collections of lipoprotein at the back of the eye that aren't being pumped out of the retina as they normally should be. So they start to collect. That's dry macular degeneration. Is those yellow, little yellow drusen deposits. And many older people will have a few drusen lying around. It's just normal. I tell them if you're old enough to have wrinkles, you're old enough to have a few drusen. It's just part of aging. Um, but drusen don't cause sudden loss of vision. Okay. But the clue is, older person, yellow drusen deposits, new bleed at the back of the eye. Well, that, that's wet macular degeneration. How do we treat them? We do injections into the eye. Sounds horrific, but it doesn't hurt. It's one of the most common procedures in medicine now. And prior to these injections being available, people would just go blind and stay blind. But thankfully, with the agents that we have now, uh, you can at least stabilize vision and in most cases improve it. The class of drugs that we use are called anti-VEGF, anti-VEGF. VEGF stands for vascular endothelial growth factor. Okay, so vascular endothelial growth factor gets upregulated in many ocular conditions, including AMD. We also use it in diabetes. And anti-VEGF temporarily binds the VEGF molecules and the little abnormal blood vessel temporarily shr shrinks. Sometimes it permanently shrinks, but more often temporarily shrinks, stops bleeding, blood clears, vision improves. Anti-VEGF injections, they need to be on your radar because whether you're a GP or you do something else, you'll be, you're going to be seeing older patients who are getting these injections all the time. And you're going to wonder what the hell's going on. So they're getting injections most commonly for wet AMD. Okay, And the injections need to be regular and fairly frequent in order for the effects to be maintained. If they're not injected, the blood vessel returns and, and you can get recurrence of bleeding. Um, Anti-VEGF injections are what puts people at risk of endophthalmitis. So you remember I talked about endophthalmitis earlier. This is such a common procedure now, about one in 5,000 get endophthalmitis. But if there's 5,000 injections a day happening in around Australia, um, then infections are going to be happening fairly commonly. It's probably about as much as you need to know. If you've got wet AMD in one eye, there's a risk of there's a risk to the other eye if the other eye hasn't been affected. So, the person needs to have both eyes uh, examined and monitored. Does anyone have a grandparent or know someone that's getting injections for AMD? If you ask around, almost certainly someone you know will be. It's just so common now. Okay, retinal vascular occlusions. This means arterial occlusions and venous occlusions. Two different diseases, both of them cause sudden painless visual loss, okay? So arterial occlusions, you're either getting a plaque or an embolus in an artery. Could be the central retinal artery or could be a branch artery, okay? Branch artery will give you a scotoma let's say superior or inferior, central retinal artery occlusion will give you complete loss of vision. Uh, both of them are more or less instantaneous or, or very rapid at least and painless. This is a stroke. So this is a stroke to the eye. It needs to be treated as a stroke. So it's potentially a life-threatening condition and a proportion of people who have had a retinal arterial occlusion will go on to have a stroke. So this is the opportunity to potentially save someone having a stroke. So they need a referral to uh, GenMed or, or uh, Neuro even. And, uh, and they need some imaging and um, potentially uh, antiplatelet agent if they're not on one already. They definitely need a carotid Doppler ultrasound to check for a clot um, in the carotid arteries in case, in case that's where the embolus is coming from. And they also need uh, a trans echo um, 
to see if that's where the clot's coming from, if they've got a mural thrombus or um, a dicky valve or something like that. More simply than that, you want to check the pulse and do an ECG to see if they're in AF. Uh, and that's the reason for the, the clot. And they also just need a, a vascular workup. So uh, fasting lipids, cholesterol, uh, sorry, um, uh, glucose, blood pressure, uh, this sort of thing. So the retinal artery person is a stroke patient. And this is what it looks like. So there's a central retinal arterial occlusion and then a branch retinal arterial occlusion. You'll see with both of them, the retina looks pale. So where the retina is normally uh, orange to red, it, it looks whitish. And that's because you've got edema of that section of ischemic retina. It's not getting a blood supply and, and it becomes somewhat edematous and that edematous retina tends to look white. Um, Again, unless you're using ophthalmic equipment, often you won't necessarily be able to see this very easily, except for with a central retinal arterial occlusion, the, the vision's going to be crap. The vision's going to be 6 over 60 or worse. And they're going to have a relative afferent pupillary defect. So we'll go through this next week, but you check the pupils. They've got an RAPD. The vision's terrible. Sudden painless loss of vision. You need to be thinking about a CRAO. And if you do a dilated exam on that person, you can actually examine the central macula with an ophthalmoscope. And normally it should look, look reddish orange, like this tissue up here. But in a CRAO, you'll get this sort of view where it will look white, but in the middle, it will look bright red, okay? So the sort of hallmark of a CRAO, it's what's called a cherry red spot. The cherry red spot is that red bit in the middle. Actually, that red is just normal tissue because the central macula has a dual blood supply. So that's just preserved normal red retinal tissue, but it looks relatively very red, like a cherry, because all of the retina around it is whitish because it's now ischemic, okay? So cherry red spot, poor vision, RAPD, um, vascular path, AF, these are all the, they're all the hallmarks of your CRAO patient. And BRAO. This patient actually has visible plaque. If you look at that retinal artery there, you've got uh, a little uh, platelet plaque there. Um, CRVO or BRVO, retinal vein occlusion, different mechanism. Okay, What happens with these guys is um, generally they're hypertensive patients. That's the most important risk factor for these guys. It's not so much... Uh, your other risk factors. It's more hypertension. So they get arteriosclerosis. They get these sclerosed retinal arterioles, hard artery. Hard artery squashes a spongy vein and blocks the vein or causes a localised flow uh, disturbance so that you get a thrombus forming in that part of the vein. So this is what they look like. Lots of blood. Blood everywhere, okay? So whereas... With a, a CRAO is an inflow problem. You're not getting enough blood coming in, so everything goes pale. CRVO is an outflow problem. Blood can't get out, veins blocked, bleeds into the retina. Yeah, it's a door actually. Um, so if you see lots of blood, the, the, symptoms are, the symptoms are similar. So this person's gonna have a scotoma if it's a branch occlusion or they're going to have near total loss of vision if it's a bad central retinal vein occlusion. Um, but the difference is if you manage to get a view in an arterial occlusion, you're generally not going to see blood. It's unusual to see blood. Whereas with a vein occlusion, there's blood everywhere. That's the hallmark. And by blood, I don't mean blood in the vitreous, like we were seeing with the vitreous hemorrhages. I mean blood on the retina. So you can see it's distributed uh, it's distributed kind of in line with the, with the fibres of the retina, if you can imagine those running in a sort of circular pattern around the back of the eye. But your view to the fundus is fine. It's not obscured by blood in front. You can see everything. There's just blood there where it doesn't belong. Uh, so retinal artery occlusion, that's a stroke workup. Retinal vein occlusion, definitely want to check blood pressure and other vascular risk factors. Um, but... 
it's you're not really thinking stroke and heart attack with a vein occlusion. You're more thinking hypertension, obesity, general health, uh, that sort of thing. We need to see both of them. Both of these can have down the track complications. Um, vein occlusions are treatable by us. We can improve vision with vein occlusions. Generally with arterial occlusions, you can't. Once the retina is infarcted, it's infarcted. Um, some treatments that have been described that are worth doing if you're in an emergency department, ocular massage is one. So that's one where you literally put some topical anesthetic on the eye and just gently blot or massage the eye. And the thinking there is if you've got a plaque sitting in an artery, it might dislodge that plaque so it moves further down the capillary stream and doesn't affect the centre of the retina. No great evidence for that, but it's pretty harmless, so it's worth doing. Uh, the other one is you get them to breathe into a paper bag so they get a higher CO2 concentration. So in theory, the blood vessels dilate. And again, if you've got a plaque or an embolus that's lodged into a blood vessel, it'll move down. Again, there's not much evidence for any of this stuff, but there's nothing else you can do. So most people will do this. If we see them, we will do what's called an, uh, an anterior chamber paracentesis. So that means we stick a very fine gauge needle, 30 gauge needle, into the anterior chamber after numbing the eye and release a little bit of fluid. Eye goes soft and again the thinking is the action of the eye being decompressed might dislodge uh, an embolus. I've never seen any of these things work but that's the treatment that's described out there. The final thing is hyperbaric oxygen chamber. So they've got one at Fremantle, you've got an ischemic eye the thinking is you stick them in a hyperbaric chamber and, and you improve the perfusion to the eye. Mixed views on that in ophthalmology, um, but at least, you've, at, le at least you've heard it. From your point of view, the key thing is these are vascular occlusions. Are they happening elsewhere in the body? Is this person at risk of a stroke or a heart problem? That's the lines that you need to be thinking along. So moving on to acute or subacute visual disturbance. So they were the sudden loss of vision, everything that I just talked about. So I often hear this term bilateral papilledema or unilateral papilledema. Papilledema means bilateral disc swelling. Okay? So you, you don't have unilateral papilledema. It doesn't make any sense. Papilledema means both optic discs are swollen. If only one optic disc is swollen, that's unilateral optic disc swelling. And the differential list for those two is different. Commonly, you'll, you'll hear uh, funny versions of that nomenclature, but now you've, now you've heard the correct version, so try and remember it. Um, papilledema is a brain tumour until proven otherwise. Okay? You've got swelling of both optic nerves, intracranial pressure is potentially up, that's a brain tumour, until they've had neuroimaging. So the key things with those guys is to get prompt neuroimaging. The other really important thing to do is just do a bedside blood pressure because malignant hypertension is life-threatening. It can also cause a headache just like a brain tumour can or hydrocephalus can or meningitis can but it's eminently treatable so you have to do a blood pressure. Um, other things that can cause papilledema, uh, venous sinus thrombosis uh, or just sinus thrombosis in, in the head. So again, that's where you need neuroimaging. You have to think of infection. Something's happening in the head. Um, there is a condition called idiopathic intracranial hypertension, which you may have heard of, IIH. IIH is a condition that tends to affect uh, young females, childbearing age. So we're talking mid-20s to mid-30s, um, recent weight gain, uh, is a risk factor um, and it's a diagnosis of exclusion. So you need to do all your other tests before uh, referring to a neurologist and us uh, to think about IIH. It's very common. IIH is very common. That's why I'm mentioning it. Uh, it's probably the most common cause of papilledema, but it's the last one on your list. The first one on your list is all the dangerous stuff. So these are images of, um, 
of swollen optic nerves and, and they're progressively getting worse as the images goes to go down. What I really want you to pay attention to, I mean, we've had OSCEs on this stuff in the past, so <laughs> you, I don't want to frighten you, but you want to get familiar with these, with these photos. A normal optic nerve has a crisp outline where you've got a clear demarcation between nerve tissue and retina, okay? Nerve looks yellowy white, retina looks orange, there's a clear margin. As papilledema worsens, so this, so this is fuzzy on this side. I don't know if you can appreciate the difference between that and that. And with these ones, you've, you've lost the clear demarcation altogether. And you've got some hemorrhage around the place. And the blood vessels are partially obscured as well at the optic disc margin. So they're the things that you're looking for. Is the optic disc margin distinct? Can I clearly see um, a circular diameter? Or does it look kind of fuzzy? Do the blood vessels look obscured at the margins of the optic disc? Is there hemorrhage around the place? Because hemorrhage doesn't belong there. They're the things that you're looking for. Your, papilla, your true papilledema patient is going to have a headache. They may have vomited. They may have other neurological symptoms. Um, and uh, the headache tends to be position dependent. So if they bend over, it's worse. Pressure goes up. Uh, there's some of the questions to ask. And management from your point of view is do a full uh, cranial nerve exam and peripheral nerve exam. Um, test the vision, obviously, do an optic nerve exam. Check the blood pressure, organize some neuroimaging and, uh, and speak to us. Um, and yeah, always, I mean, it's almost never a tumor. I've seen a handful in my career, but that, that needs to be at the top of your list. A cause of unilateral optic nerve swelling or optic neuropathy is giant cell arteritis, also known as temporal arteritis. So this is an inflammatory condition that affects older people, generally 70 plus, more or less hasn't been described in under 50 year olds, okay? <clears throat> These guys have a headache. They tend to have focal tenderness on the side where the temporal artery is, is affected. So the question you ask them it does, is, does it hurt when you brush your hair? Does it hurt when you brush your hair? Which means they touch the scalp and it hurts on the affected side. Uh, and uh, what's happening is you've got thickening of the, the intima of the temporal artery, thickening of the intima and swelling of the, the mural tissue of the temporal artery. So as a result, the lumen gets squashed and you get relative ischemia to that part of the head. You can actually get necrosis of the overlying skin if it's left long enough, but more importantly, you lose blood supply um, to the ophthalmic artery and you can get a subacute visual loss as a result. The problem with uh, two things with giant cell arteritis, firstly, untreated, it will involve the second eye sooner or later. So it is a cause of sequential blindness and it's irreversible once it's done that. Uh, and the second thing is, there is a risk of myocardial infarction with GCA. So it is a systemic disease. Um, so it's a, this, al this is also a threat to sight and life. So you want to palpate along the temporal artery and you want to see A, is it tender? B, can I actually feel the temporal artery? Because sometimes, in, uh, sometimes you can barely even feel a pulse because the blood supply is so diminished. And then if you look at the, the back of the eye, acutely you'll see swelling like that. So you can appreciate again, you've lost that nice, crisp, round optic disc appearance and instead you've got a fuzzy appearance. So if, if I've got a 70-year-old acute visual disturbance, headache, that's all I need to hear to be thinking about GCA. So then I'm palpating the scalp, I'm examining the eye and very importantly you want to do a full blood count ESR and CRP. They're the blood tests for GCA because an ESR and CRP and, and platelets almost invariably will be elevated um, in giant cell arteritis. Treatment is high dose steroids. So we tend to admit these people and give them methyl prednisolone, um, one gram a day for three days, and, and that works quite well. And you discharge them on high dose oral prednisolone. Uh, and in that time, we'll also do a temporal artery biopsy. 
because you want to clinch the, di the diagnosis. So we take these guys to theatre and, and do a biopsy of two to three centimetres of the temporal artery, send that off to the lab, and they're looking for the, the granulomatous inflammation which, which characterises this uh, disease. So this is, this is an urgent referral. It goes without saying, if you're suspicious of GCA, don't uh, delay giving prednisolone. Unless there's a definite contraindication, if it's going to be two days till they see an ophthalmologist or till they ha can have a biopsy done, just give them uh, oral pred. The dose is one milligram per kilogram per day. For most people, that works out to 70-odd milligrams a day of prednisolone. Um, so you want to give them something to cover for gastritis if they're not already on omeprazole or isomeprazole, because steroids can exacerbate that. And uh, the usual warnings with giving systemic steroids can affect blood pressure and mood and sleep and weight gain and, and all these other things. Um, the reason we do a biopsy is these guys stay on steroids for up to 18 months. So it's not something we take lightly. That can cause lots of atone problems, obviously. So that's GCA. Okay, double vision and strabismus means squint, wonky eyes. Okay, three nerves. So we sort of overlap with, with neurology here. Three cranial nerves that, that uh, innovate the eye for ocular movements. This is a good website, by the way, Optho Book. Recommend it. Um, third nerve, fourth nerve, and, and sixth nerve. So third nerve does everything apart from abduction, abduction, turning the eye laterally. That's the sixth nerve. It's called the abducens nerve. Uh, and uh, other than that, the third nerve pretty much does everything. The fourth nerve, turn, it's got a couple of funny actions, but the primary action is it turns the eye down when the eye is adducted. So when the eye is facing towards the nose, the fourth nerve helps to turn it down. Okay. So why that matters is your fourth nerve palsy patients will describe diplopia when they're walking downstairs or when they're trying to read. Okay, That's the question stem. Fourth nerve is, and it's vertical diplopia, because the fourth nerve's primary action is an up and down movement. Okay, So they are describing two images, one on top of each other, when they're looking down, trying to read or trying to walk downstairs. I find it hard walking downstairs. Okay, uh, The most common cause of a fourth uh, th th it's the most common congenital um, uh, one of these three. And it can be there your whole life and then just decompensate when you're in your 50s and 60s. You've been compensating for it neurologically your whole life, become symptomatic later. But trauma is another cause, so car accidents. Uh, and with all of the, these three, you have to think about uh, an intracranial aneurysm as well, squashing the nerve. So neuroimaging is important. So fourth nerve palsy, vertical down gaze. Third nerve palsy, that's your down and out eye. You might remember that from neurology. And often the eyelid is involved as well. So because the sixth nerve is still working, the eye gets pulled outwards. Okay, And the, you get a ptosis as well, so the eyelid comes down because the third nerve supplies the levator muscle of the upper eyelid too. And you can get a medriasis, so, so dilation of the pupil. So third nerve is down and out, ptosis, medriasis. That's your sort of classic presentation. Sixth nerve is uh, can't turn the eye outwards in the affected eye. So it's double vision when I'm trying to look towards the affected side. And sixth nerve is probably the easiest one to spot on examination. The eye simply can't turn in one direction. Um, it's usually the most benign one as well. It's quite common in diabetics. You just get a little microvascular infarct. It tends to recover on its own. So what's this guy got? Does anyone want to offer a... Which nerve and, and which eye? Anyone brave enough? So I'll give you a clue. In the top picture, he's being asked to look straight ahead. So we call that primary gaze. Just look straight ahead. What are, what are the abnormalities? 
Go on, be brave. Yes, which eye's got ptosis? Good. So what are you thinking? Yeah, what else is abnormal about the right eye? It's down and out. Yeah, there you go. And it can't turn in. Okay? So you see when he's looking to his left, so the, so the, the, the C, the bottom picture, he's looking to his left. The right eye can't look left because the medial rectus isn't working. The third nerve's gone. Okay, so here's his, here's his normal eye looking left. This eye can't look left because the third nerve's stuffed. It can still look right because the sixth nerve is okay. Okay, so there's a, there's a third nerve palsy. Ptosis is there, that's the clue. That's the obvious clue. So the other thing with fourth nerve palsy is people tend to compensate by tilting their head towards the... Uh, sorry, away from the affected side. Away from the affected side. Um, so if you see someone that comes in with a head tilt and they're describing vertical diplopia, if you straighten their head, that'll make the vertical diplopia worse. So head tilt, it just goes with the, the fourth nerve palsy presentation and the head tilt is a way of actually aligning the eyes which have become vertically misaligned as a result of the fourth nerve palsy. So you'll exacerbate the diplopia by turning them towards um, the affected side. Fourth nerve palsy is probably the hardest one to spot on examination. So if we were going to examine you on that, most of it would be in the stem, would be in the, the history. So, you, so it's the one that's going to give you your, your vertical diplopia. But uh, yeah, the abnormality here is in her right eye as she's got the eye turned in, she's unable. Where do we go? She's unable to look down as much as she can with the other side. So, do you see how this eye is kind of buried into the eyelid? This eye isn't. It can't, because that's the action of the fourth nerve is to turn it down and adduction. And it's the right eye. And look at her; she's tilting away from that eye. Okay. So that's what a fourth nerve palsy looks like. All of these are an aneurysm until proven otherwise. Okay. Uh, unequal pupils, everyone's favourite. Does anyone know what this is? It's not a third nerve palsy, but there is ptosis. Yeah, so what's, what's the triad that everyone talks about with Horner's? I've given you one bit already. Yes. Yes. That word. Good. <laughs> yep. And this guy's clearly got ptosis and, and uh, if you look carefully enough, you'll appreciate he does have meiosis, the size of that pupil compared to that one. Okay. So about 20% of us have unequal pupils. That's just physiological. It's one millimetre or less of difference. But again, that's a diagnosis of exclusion. The two conditions that you need to think about with anisocoria are, are Horner syndrome um, and third nerve palsy, which we've already talked about, because they can be um, dangerous. With Horner syndrome, as you may remember, is a problem in the sympathetic chain from the brain down to the neck. So if you've got new ptosis and new anisocoria, you're thinking Horner's and you're going to do imaging of head and neck. Um, carotid artery dissections can do this. So if someone tells you they've had some funny feeling in the neck and now they've got this, I mean, that's life-threatening. Um, th big thyroid tumour, big mediastinal tumour. The other one is the pancos tumour, you know, the apex of the lung, uh, which can affect the, the, the sympathetic chain. Horner's is pretty uncommon, but it is a threat to life. So uh, you need to know it. Um, and uh, the, a good test to do with all pupil problems is test the pupils in light and dark, okay? To try and convince yourself which is the abnormal pupil. So, so here we've got the Horner's pupil, okay? Turn the lights off and this pupil dilates, the other, the other pupil doesn't dilate that well. So that helps to tell you in, in dark conditions, 
you're getting inadequate dilatation. That's the abnormal pupil. If you leave them in the dark, that's the bottom uh, image. They do tend to dilate a bit after prolonged dark exposure, but it's still not as dilated as, as the other pupil. But the key thing is going from light to dark, the hornous pupil doesn't dilate adequately, whereas if it's just physiological anisocoria, then that will dilate normally, and, and that's the test. Um, with the, uh, the opposite is true with the third nerve palsy. So it won't constrict enough under light conditions, okay? So your dilated pupil in the third nerve won't constrict enough, and you're also gonna test test ocular motility. <coughs> Anytime you've got pupil or lid involvement, test the eye movements, because you wanna try and see if it's multiple cranial nerves that are involved. Often nerve palsies come together. You don't just get a simple isolated nerve palsy. You need to check whether it's isolated or whether it's what we call complex, so you can have multiple palsies at the same time. So imaging is the key here, and, um, and talk to us again. Proptosis, so bulging eyes. Most common cause of proptosis is thyroid eye disease, or these days it's called thyroid-associated orbitopathy, because it's not just the eye, it's the whole socket and orbit. Uh, both of these patients have thyroid eye disease, okay? In the top one, her right eye is more affected, and in the bottom eye, in the bottom one, both eyes are obviously badly affected. This can present reasonably acutely or, or subacutely. Um, so they become thyrotoxic and, and the eyes start to bulge and become red and uncomfortable. These guys often can't close their eyes completely. So at night time, they get corneal exposure because the eyes don't close completely. As a result, the surface becomes dry and you can get corneal erosions and then infection as a result. And that's where the trouble starts. The other thing is, if the orbital inflammation is bad enough, it can actually squash the optic nerve. So very important with these guys to check optic nerve function and to check motility, um, ocular motility, because bad thyroid eye disease can affect eye movements, can give them diplopia, all sorts, all so sorts of things. So that's the most common cause of proptosis. It's not instantaneous, though. There are instantaneous causes of proptosis. The, the top one there is called a carotid cavernous fistula. So it's a fistula between the carotid and the cavernous sinus. It can be spontaneous or can be traumatic, okay? So she's got sudden onset proptosis in her left eye and you get injection of the eye. The eye looks red. They, they, they get what we call corkscrew conjunctival vessels and um, it's a pulsatile proptosis. So if you gently put your hand on it, I've seen a couple of these. You get a little pulsatility, put your stethoscope on there, you hear a brewy, believe it or not, because you've got a direct uh, fistula between the carotid and the cavernous sinus. The patient can sometimes hear a whooshing noise, they'll have a headache, it's not a nice condition. Um, and uh, interventional radiology is who needs to get involved with this, but we help with the, um, we help with the, uh, with the diagnosis. Um, and the bottom one, which is, uh, looks horrible, is a cavernous sinus thrombosis. So that's a clot in the cavernous sinus. The cavernous sinuses communicate with each other. So it affects one side, it can affect the other side. And uh, uh, infection is a common cause. So if you've got an infection of the sinuses or, or fa paras paranasal or facial sinuses, you can get clots forming. And as a result, you get impaired venous outflow from the whole eye socket and the pressure builds up, blood builds up obviously, that can squash the optic nerve, that's an ocular uh, emergency as well and more importantly it's a threat to life because potentially they've got an infection in the head. So fasting, urgent neuroimaging, multiple consults, you know, this is, this is the urgent stuff. Um, getting towards the end now, so leukocoria means a white pupil reflex instead of a red reflex, okay? So uh, this one didn't even need a bright light to show you the red reflex, but this is the abnormal, uh, that's the abnormal side, looks whitish, okay? 
and uh, again uh, with a photograph. So you know you do flash photography and rather than getting red eye, you get a white pupil looking back at you. Most often it's just the angle that the photo that was taken on and it's an artifact. But there have been education campaigns out there. Any hint of a white pupil, white eye instead of red eye, uh, that needs urgent assessment because um, little kids can't get tumours in the eye. Retinoblastoma is the most common intraocular tumour of childhood, okay? So remember that word, retinoblastoma. That's a threat to sight and life, okay? It's about 1% to 2% of all childhood tumours. It can present in many different ways, but an absent red reflex or leukocoria uh, is the one to remember. It can present with a painful eye, pressure going up, a kid's not going to be able to tell you that they've lost vision. So that you're not going to get a you know, an infant or a toddler presenting with visual loss. Even children sometimes don't know that they've lost vision because the other eye compensates for it so well. Uh, but what can happen is they can get a new squint. Squint means a deviated eye, a wonky eye. Uh, because in kids, if the vision gets shut off in one eye, the eye tends to stray because the connection between the eye and the brain is disturbed and they get a squint or a strabismus. So a new onset squint or strabismus, eye turned out, eye turned in, that's another um, suspicious sign where you want to check the red reflex and make sure that it's there. If it's not, send them on immediately. Uh, retinoblastoma can be treated in various ways. Um, laser is a common way that it's treated here in Perth, laser treatment. If it's small enough, if it's really big uh, and there are parameters for this and it's affecting the whole eye, then unfortunately the eye does have to be removed. But if that's a life-saving thing, then you know most parents will accept that, obviously. Um, so uncommon, but uh, that's why we do six-week checks on babies and red reflex is part of that six-week neonatal check. Um, and that's best done in a darkened room. You don't have to dilate a kid's eyes to check for the red reflex. Just turn the lights down, get out your ophthalmoscope, get their attention with something, a toy or kids love mobile phones, and just sit there watching them for a while. And sooner or later you'll get a red reflex um, more often than not. Okay, so we've reached the end of this small marathon. Um, in conclusion, I'd just like to bring us back to the curriculum. We've talked about half of the things on here. So if, if this slide looks overwhelming, it doesn't need to be because we've just covered in a, in a reasonable amount of detail about half the curriculum. The other half is the chronic um, non-urgent stuff, which you also need to know about. Cataracts, dry age-related macular degeneration, eyelid stuff, um, which I'll cover in another talk, and I'll let you know when the date of that talk is going to be. Um, but everything I've talked about today, we've probably covered 30-something conditions. I each one of those would have fit on a palm card, so don't feel overwhelmed. Uh, and just remember the two different ways of thinking about it, common versus serious, red eye versus visual disturbance. Uh, do, um, do try and sort of zoom in on the clues and the triggers of each presentation, so the person's age, their occupation, are they a tradie, what's the history, is it painful, non-painful, and so on. Um, and this will be up on the LMS, so all those abbreviations will be there. A um, bunch of references that I recommend. That Optho book that I mentioned, the third one down there, that's worth checking out. He's an ophthalmologist in North America and he makes a lot of videos and cartoons. He's an animator himself. So he's very good. Um, and um, thanks for listening. Uh